So the theory of behavioral finance sounds great, but in the end, we need to figure out how do we actually implement this stuff. Well, so we've developed a five-step process that is designed to systematically exploit behavioral bias at each juncture along the way. And this is not to say that this is the only way one can do this, and we're going to try to limit the detail to some extent so this doesn't become a 20-hour lecture, but it's to give us an idea of how one might actually implement this in practice. Now, quantitative value effectively buys cheap, high-quality stocks that Wall Street hates. That's the end state of what we're trying to achieve here. But it's not because we just decided at the beginning that that's a good idea. It's because it was built upon through a variety of steps to try to exploit bias problems. So it, it just turns out that these are the stocks that suffer from the most behavioral bias and tend to have the largest limits of arbitrage. And as we discussed in the theory, when we have that combination of bias as well as limited arbitrage, we find mispricing opportunities. In other words, quantitative value is really a dream for those that actually believe in this behavioral finance stuff, which of course we do. Now, if you're one that believes that the market is perfectly efficient, then what we describe here represents simply a story, but not an empirically robust bus phenomenon. So the biases we seek to exploit with quantitative value in particular are the following. One lottery bias, and this is a bias where people tend to overvalue lottery-like payoffs. Now, representative bias is all about naive extrapolation of short-term trends, and we'll talk about how that affects investor behavior and stock prices. And then the next one is limited attention. And limited attention simply refers to the fact that our minds have a limited ability to focus on all things all the time. Finally, we're left with availability or what you could call saliency bias. And this is this bias that we had previously discussed, which simply means that humans tend to overweight the probability of events that are more available in their mind. So if they see the same thing over and over again, or sell side analysts or CNBC commentators are mentioning something, that piece of information that is very available and easy to recall for us tends to get overweighted in a probability sense. All right, so step one, let's first look at lottery bias. So here's a table from the maxing out paper which shows very clearly, I think, what happens to stocks that exhibit lottery-like behavior. And what the authors do is they sort stocks each month based on the highest daily return of stocks for that prior month. Those stocks with large one-day returns are considered more akin to lotteries, whereas those stocks that don't have this sort of price action are considered less like lotteries. Then what, the, what happens next is the authors identify these lottery characteristics and they sort the portfolios based on this. And they find that investors on average overvalue the lottery type stocks, which is represented here by the high max portfolios and the associated alpha, which controls for firm specific characteristics. And the lesson from this paper, I think, is that we want to avoid zero or one type investments because other investors may overpay for these situations. Plus, investments like this can cause a serious capital preservation problem. Now, we're going to talk in more detail in a later presentation about exactly how we think about avoiding lottery stocks, but the lesson learned for the time being is that lottery stocks in general are something to be avoided. So moving on to representative bias. So the original paper on this subject comes from Lakonshock, Schleifer, and Vishny, 94, which is a journal finance paper, which is commonly referred to as LSV. And the authors wrote this paper to counter the conjecture that the reason value stocks earn higher returns over time relative to growth stocks is due to the risk inherent in growth stocks. LSV made the claim that the value spread is not due to increased risk, but due to behavioral bias. 
And in particular, LSV focused on the idea that investors suffer from representative bias and extrapolate good news about gross stocks into the far future and bad news about value stocks into the far future. But because of representative short-term patterns that cause investors to extrapolate way out in time different growth rates, investors along that path fail to appreciate that these growth rates in the future tend to be highly mean reverting. If we have a value stock and it starts having a poor run, we extrapolate it down to negative infinity. If we have a growth stock that has a good run, we extrapolate that great growth out to positive infinity. And of course, systematically what happens is value stocks with poor growth rates tend to mean revert back to average. Growth stocks with great growth rates tend to mean revert back to the overall market average. But because the market fails to appreciate this fact, value stocks systematically surprise the market. So other people dug in the weeds of this LSV conjecture and confirmed that the value anomaly is likely due, at least in part, to behavioral bias and not 100% due to a risk-based phenomenon. Now, the bottom chart shows the relationship between past earnings growth and future earnings growth. So as we see here, these glamour or gross stocks in the lowest portfolio rank based on book to market have really high past earnings growth, but their future earning growth mean reverts. So it starts to weigh down. Meanwhile, the cheapest decile of stocks, the value stocks, have done terribly recently, actually have negative earnings growth, but their future earnings growth mean reverts back. And this is a general pattern across markets where growth is a mean reverting phenomenon, likely due to microeconomic story involved there, where if a firm is making a whole bunch of money, a lot of entrants will come into that marketplace driving the returns on the capital down. Similarly, in markets where the world is falling apart, a lot of players leave that space, which allows the current people in place to earn and enjoy higher returns on their capital. And what happens here, and what the, the Shao and Sloan papers show, is that it's the sell-side security analysts that fail to appreciate this mean reversion. And because the markets often follow the lead of the sell-side analysts, Value stocks continually surprise the market on average when they come out with their earnings estimates relative to the growth stocks, which continually surprise to the downside when they come out with their growth estimates. Overall, this is represented by the representative bias phenomenon. Here's our own study. We look here at simple tercile sorts, which means we just sort the universe based on EBIT to total enterprise value for mid and large cap firms from 1980 to 2013. And what we see is that there is a clear relationship between price paid and future performance. Now one could argue that value stocks are much riskier than growth stocks and therefore warrant the nearly 4% premium for low price stocks versus high price stocks. However, one could also argue that much of this premium earned by these value stocks is really more associated with representative bias in the marketplace and investor irrationality. So next we'll look at limited attention. So Piotrowski and So suggest that investors fail to appreciate how company fundamentals relate to returns. Where when I mean company fundamentals, we're not talking about future expected growth rates now. We're talking about balance sheet items, income statement items, things that we can look at that have happened in the past. And it seems as though investors bucket firms with similar price characteristics into the same bin but fail to recognize differences in their underlying fundamentals or what we call quality. For example, you might have IBM at a 10 times price to earnings ratio, and you may also have Madoff and company at a 10 times price to earnings ratio. The example here is to illustrate that Madoff would be, in theory, a 
worse off company than IBM, at least fundamentally, even though both are considered value stocks. For illustrative purposes, consider that IBM has stronger balance sheet and income statement items, and Madoff actually has some money in the bank, but not that much. Well, it turns out that this what I would consider somewhat obvious element of stock prices is overlooked by market participants who are so focused on the news about future growth rates and the opinions of sell-side analysts that they forget to focus on fundamentals. So what Pietrowski show in particular in their study is that the value growth strategy, which is simply the spread between value stocks and growth stocks, can be split based on fundamentals. So if we do a strategy that is long value stocks that have great fundamentals and short growth stocks that have terrible fundamentals, you get the returns associated with the straight line. If we do the opposite, we do a strategy that is long, low quality value and short, high quality growth, we get the dotted line. And what you notice is that the straight line does really well on average. The dotted line's basically right around zero. And then the black lines, which is just the standard value growth strategy, kind of somewhere in the middle. And what the intent of this analysis is meant to show is that investors are failing to appreciate how fundamentals relate to the returns associated with value and growth strategies. And the bottom line lesson here is that when looking within value stocks, we should think about fundamentals. Again, we do our own quick and dirty study of this, and we say, how does this phenomenon play out via simple stock sorts on price and quality? So for price, we use our EBIT to total enterprise value sort, and we move stocks into three bins, and then we further sort those price bins into different quality bins based on our quantitative value algorithm, which is beyond the scope of the current discussion, but it's essentially a computerized version of what Graham does in security analysis. Just looking at balance sheet and income statement items to see if this company is is of higher or lower relative quality. What you look at in the chart here is that there seems to be a general increase in returns associated with price. So if you pay a high price, you tend to earn lower returns than if you pay a low price, which are these green bars. What we also notice is there seems to be a return premium associated with quality, where lower quality firms holding constant price tend to earn less expect a return than high quality firms. This effect is not as strong as price, but it definitely seems to be there. This, of course, is completely counterintuitive since lower quality firms are presumably riskier and therefore should earn higher expected returns on average. We see the opposite. And we attribute this quality premium to a limited attention bias, specifically related to investors' limited attention and focus on balance sheet strength and firm fundamentals. So moving on now to the final piece of the puzzle that, that we like to use, and that is how do we exploit availability bias? So before we dive in on the particulars of how we exploit availability bias, let's just discuss some research that's already been done by various academics. Now, if you remember, availability bias is this situation where things that are available or salient in our minds are considered highly probable, even though they may not actually be any more likely than things that are less available in our minds. So, for example, if we just endured an earthquake, even though maybe unconditionally an earthquake probability is 1%, we're now going to think that earthquakes are going to happen every single year. The same thing happens in investing. So if we look at this study by Fang and Perez, which is a 2009 journal finance paper, in this study, the authors look at the performance of stocks with high media coverage relative to no media coverage after controlling for common characteristics that we already know explain returns. So controlling for market beta, size of the firm, exposure to value, momentum, and so forth, how does media coverage affect returns? And the result is fairly striking. High coverage firms down here slightly underperform 
whereas no coverage firms tend to earn excess returns. And the argument behind this phenomenon is it's an availability bias problem. And the logic is fairly straightforward. Is it more likely that a stock that is on CNBC every day and being talked about by all the Wall Street analysts is overvalued relative to a stock that no one has ever heard of? Because of availability, the argument is that the stock that is on CNBC each day will have information that is highly available to market participants, and therefore they increases the probability that they may form incorrect probability assessments when they produce analysis about the CNBC stock relative to the stock that no one's ever heard of. How would we operationalize this idea given data constraints and some of our own in-house analysis on ways to exploit availability bias. So one of the things we like to look at is sell-side opinion. Sell-side analysts are often the talk of Wall Street and their information is highly available on the street. Everyone's reading the report, everyone's talking about it on Wall Street. So this seems like a good opportunity to perhaps exploit availability bias by focusing on sell side. So we hypothesize that when Wall Street opinion was concentrated in one direction, versus more dispersed, we'd be able to capture an availability premium. The general concept is that when all the sell side analysts are bearish on a security, and they're all citing the same reasons for a downfall, these stocks might suffer from availability bias more than stocks where the sell side opinion is more dispersed. And there's not a single story coming out that can influence investors one way or the other. So for illustration, what we do is we break out the portfolio that is the cheap, high quality portfolio, and we break it out into the high optimism and low optimism buckets. And the results are pretty clear. The cheap, high quality stocks that Wall Street hates, and presumably the stocks that are suffering the most from availability bias, tend to do very well in the future. Whereas those cheap, high-quality stocks that Wall Street can't decide on, where presumably people are suffering less from availability bias, tend to perform just a little bit better than the average market. So it does appear that availability bias contributes to this excess return associated with the low optimism or the stocks that Wall Street hates. So to recap, this was an explanation of how one might apply behavioral finance in financial markets. And our job is to try to exploit as much bias as we possibly can in a systematic way. And we have sidestepped, admittedly, the discussion of limits arbitrage in this presentation, mainly due to time constraints and a desire to save some of our internal research for the benefit of our own investors. Nevertheless, as a general rule, the securities generated by the process just described are by construction the stocks that many institutional investors wrinkle their nose at and discuss. They think we are insane for wanting to own the cheap, high-quality stocks that Wall Street hates. We think we are simply practicing sound behavioral finance by building systems that beat behavioral bias.